Welcome back to Sentimental Journey. Tomorrow is the birthday anniversary of that delightful entertainer, Gracie Fields. Gracie would have been 85 tomorrow. And to mark the occasion, we're going to play you some excerpts from a recording put out in tribute to Gracie Fields by the British Broadcasting Corporation, taking recordings from their own sound archives. Records introduced by Stanley Holloway, and it begins with Gracie singing the song which became her theme. Stanley. was Gracie Fields singing the song Sally, which had become a kind of signature tune for her. There she was singing to a capacity audience in her special Ensor Gala show at the Royal Albert Hall in 1941. She had come a long way by then and was recognized as a great star of show business. I never knew anyone with a greater communication with an audience than Gracie Fields, but off stage Gracie was quite a shy person. She was never quite sure whether she could still give a hundred percent. But as we all know, she did and could until the end of her days. She became an international celebrity and one of the best loved artists of stage and screen. Let Gracie tell her story in her own words by broadcasts she has made for the BBC. Especially in this interview she gave to John Burns in 1968. I think everybody must know that you were born in Rochdale. Most people probably also know that you were born and christened Grace Stansfield, but I'm sure hardly anybody knows when, why and how you became Gracie Fields. Well, when I was a little girl and was first going on the stage, the people told some managers or somebody in Rochdale, they said, she'll never be a star with a name that long. She can't be called Gracie Stamsfield or Grace Stamsfield. It has to be a short name. So mother went home and studied and said, well, hmm, what do we call it? Grace Fields? It doesn't flow proper, does it? Gracie Fields, we'll, we'll keep it like that, Gracie Fields. Your mother was obviously interested uh in your own interest in, in the theatre. In the theatre, my, mm. my mother was the only pro, believe me. She was theatre mad. I couldn't be, be away for a week's holiday. She's sending me a telegram, get back, your public's fickle. She just was only happy when she saw you on that stage. That was her life she wanted to do and to live herself, and she never got on it, so she made sure that I stopped on it. What was your father's attitude? Did he go along? He didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> mother always won the toss there, although there were many, many consultations with my mother's aunt, who was very religious, and that part of her family all saying, oh, you're sending her to the devil, Janie. You can't let her go on stage. She says, well, I don't care. She says, I think it's going to be right for our grace. And there you are. We got on with it. What was your life like as a child? Were you ever one of these uh, half-timers going to school part oh, yes. of the day and, and at the middle oh, of the rest? Oh, I did the half-time, getting mm. up at six. Well, before six, we had to be in the factory at six o'clock. And then you get your breakfast at eight o'clock till half past eight. You had a half hour for your breakfast and then back tying all the knots again until half past twelve. And then we had one hour for our lunch. And then back again half past one into the factory until half past five in the evening. And uh, when I was going to school, when I was 12 years old, I did mornings for one week and then, then and go to school in the afternoon and the other vice versa, the school in the morning the next week and the factory in the afternoon. And when did you get out of all this and get on the stage? Well, not 
actually until I was really 16, but I'd been on the stage with one thing and another mm. right up to then. I even was in a juvenile troupe from 14 to 16, with a, practically two years with this singing group. And before then I was in different juvenile troupes where I learned to dance and all the sort of acrobats of the theatre. So when you uh, went on the stage as a proper professional at 16, was this in a review? It was in a review. First I started on my own and after four weeks engagements on by myself, uh, we got in the review and then went on until, well, I suppose about 30 odd years ago. We haven't got a broadcast of her singing in review, but here she is singing to the troops in France. <laughs> the very, very early days when you started in review, started touring the north of England and the rest of the country, were those, were those then particularly hard days touring? There were wonderful days. We loved every mm. minute of it. It was all theatre. Did you know then that you were going to become a star? I felt I had everything to become a star with everybody we saw. I knew I had much more than the majority of, it, of all the people. I suppose you, you, you really became a star, didn't you, when you got to the West End in what, 1923, Mr. Tower of London? That's when they were, and then I was a star then, yeah. It really happened. When he came come to London, but I didn't believe it. I was more interested in the group of the, that was working with me on the... This was Archie Pitt's show? Yes. Had, had you married him then? I was married when I was 25, I don't know when I... <laughs> so it was before or after? So it was probably, I was... It was a, about that year, I, think, I was a star it? going round the provinces all the time mm. with his shows, you see. And when we did come to London, we went to the Alhambra Theatre. That's when they were, I was proclaimed a star. And I was, I don't know, somebody came and offered 200 pounds a week or something, and I was getting about 28 pounds, and I looked at everybody, what can I do? I can't, can't leave my sister in this show, and I can't leave the whole crowd, everybody be out of work. So I just took my mind and said, that'll come again another day. That was when I first heard Gracie Field sing in Mr. Tower of London. I was struck by her great versatility, both as a character actress and a singer. I learned afterwards that she not only performed on the stage at night, but in the daytime, she made the costumes and drilled the dancing girls. By the end of the 30s, she was earning as much as 50,000 pounds for one film. You had then in the 30s really become uh, Gracie Fields, the great international star. You'd gone a long, long way, hadn't you, from that fish and chip shop where you were born in oh, Moulsworth Street. So, yes. But had you changed? I haven't changed myself. No, no. I'm still a fish and chip shop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still the same person, if you know what I mean. I haven't changed myself. Because everything I do is a job, and I want to do that job well. You've never acted uh, like a star in the sense that you've never been apart from anybody else in the business. You've always been one of them, haven't you? One of the folks that are mm. in the show, yes. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a family girl, you see. Everybody comes in now to belong to me, and I want to belong to them. 
I've never been the kind of star that wants to go out after the show and go to a, to be seen or go to go to a cabaret because I'm always worried about my audience. If I was to go out, which I'd had to do once or twice in, in naturally in those days, I find my voice is very tired the next day. I can't give, and that upsets me. I want every audience to go out every night to feel I can go to bed and say, well, I did a good show tonight, and that's that. A few choruses, and if you like to join in, you can do. If you don't, it doesn't matter. I'll speak to you just the same as up to you. <laughs> when I grow to
That excerpt shows Grace's wonderful rapport with an audience and how she could do anything with them. It was recorded in France at a special show for the troops in November 1939. Only two months after war was declared, and incredibly, only six months after the major operation Gracie had for cancer. She got half a million get well cards and messages, including one from the Queen, now the Queen Mother. On the 30th of July, Gracie broadcast her thanks to the nation. Hello, everybody. My goodness, but this is wonderful to be back at this old microphone again and to be able to speak to and thank all you wonderful people for the great love and affection you have shown for me during what has been the most dreadful ordeal of my 41 years. I felt something was wrong for the past three or four years, but I've been taking little short holidays and thinking to myself, well, maybe it was just a rest I needed and saying to myself, well, I, really, it's impossible for a strong hardy daughter of the North to have out wrong with her, but... <laughs> After completing my last film, Shipyard Sally, I said to myself, Grace Lass, they'll have to go and see a doctor. That much worse. And I never dreamed, though, that it was going to be such a do as it's been. But thank heaven and Mr. Searle, my surgeon, and all those wonderful sisters and nurses at the Chelsea Women's Hospital, I've pulled through. And now I want to say thank you to all you wonderful people from all over the world who have written me such beautiful letters and for all the lovely flowers and telegrams and countless other presents. I tell you, you you've made me cry. I've been so overcome by your devotion. You see, I, I always thought you liked me a little bit, but I, I didn't think you loved me. Well, not so much anyway. My only wish now is to try and please you with my work in the future, as I seem to have done in the past. Now I'm going to sing a little song that I sang after an illness I had in 1939. I've been asked many times to sing it, but this is the first time I've sung it since that time. I love the moon. I the sun. I love the forest, the flowers, the fun. I love the wild birds, the dawn and the dew. of the fact that Gracie was singing to the troops only months after her illness and although the doctors had suggested a two-year rest some of the press turned against her when she left Britain in 1940. You see her life with Archie Pitt had not been a happy one but they were finally divorced in 1939. In March 1940 Gracie married Monty Banks her film director but in June of the same year, Italy entered the war on the side of Germany. And it turned out that Monty Banks, whose real name was Mario Bianchi, was 
technically still an Italian citizen, although he had left Italy when he was a boy. Gracie describes why she decided to leave Britain with her husband. Well, it was just a, during the war, we had a message from Viscount Castle Ross, who was Monty's friend, and Monty was out at the time, and he rang up and said, you must get Monty immediately to leave the country, come to Ireland immediately, but we must not go back to Italy. Well, I had arranged for my family to go to America because my mother had been sick and she'd been advised to live in a warm country. So uh, she was already there and I thought, well, get the children away. And uh, I said, well, I would like to go on that boat and you must go to America. So, and I said, I want to get on that boat by hook or crook because I feel if they go down, I shall never live. We'll go down together if we have to go down. And so that's how it sort of happened. And then when we got to America, uh, he went to America and he arranged before with Lord Lloyd and Basil Dean that I should do war work and carry on just the same, which I did across Canada, and do concerts for the benefit of the War Relief and the uh, Navy League. So he had to go to America and I was being left behind in Canada. When we arrived in Quebec, I think was the first, then all these Navy League officials, everybody, they said, yes, but your husband will have to be interned. And they were going to take him off and intern him in Canada. Mm -hmm. As well, if you intern him, you turn and turn me too, because it, it, it's daft. He's going on to America. He's not staying on here anyway. And then they started. We took 10,000 pounds worth of jewelry. There was no stoppage on it. Nobody said, have you got it or not? Anyway, when it got there, it got in the papers, it became 100,000 pounds worth of jewelry, and then 200, that oh, got ridiculous. In spite of the bad publicity, Gracie carried on entertaining the troops and raised over a half a million pounds for Britain with her concerts in Canada and America. Never afraid to face the music, she came back to Britain alone in 1941 and again in 1943 and continued with her wartime concerts to enthusiastic audiences. After the war, Gracie returned once more to Britain in 1947, having travelled all over the world and did a series of very successful radio shows entitled Gracie's Working Parties, which included local amateur talent. The first show, of course, came from our hometown of Rochdale. Well, I've got a pretty shrewd idea what you're going to sing tonight since you're in Rochdale. Yeah, we Am have I right? To, that's right. We have to sing the Rochdale Hunt. We've had so many requests, so we have to sing the Rochdale Hunt. All right. Come on, dogs. Come on, dogs. Little dogs and big dogs. Come on. Come on. Get on. Go on, dogs. Get on in front. Go on, all of you. Go on. Go on, dogs, little ones. Go on. Get over there. Keep going. Start smelling. <laughs> Hunting with the hounds at Rochdale E by gum we've got a lovely pack Whippets and Alsatians Bulldogs and Dalmatians Horses with two legs in front And two more at the back Off we went and made a fine display And she took a fence And took it with her all the way With the Rochdale hounds At the Rochdale hunt Tally ho, tally ho In hunting dress instead of clogs and shawl, jumping over fences and the backyard walls. <laughs> away, away, away we went with leaps and bounds. Young Maggie Higgins, who is known around our neighborhood, she had a nasty fall, but she's a salty piece of goods. It isn't the first time Maggie has fallen when she's been in the woods, following the Rochdale hounds. Go on, dogs, get on, keep going. What's the matter with you? Good morning, Lord Alphonse. It's a nice day for the meat, isn't it? <laughs> Have you seen my husband, my Joe? He would be. Every time we go hunting, he will go in a pub, first of all. Joe, come out of that pub. You make me sick. You never know whether you're hunting or whether you're being hunted. <laughs> come on now, give it, which is my horse? I told you to pick as a good one. What, that little thin horse, that there? Sandwich between them two fattens. <laughs> Poor thing, he have a cheek. Come on, horse, stop leaning on to the two. Come on. Stand there. Now give us a leg up, Joe, and don't take the goat. I got my thickens on its cows. <laughs> oh, cheers! Come on. E. Oh, heck, it isn't half bony. <laughs> I'll have corns when I get back and they won't be on me. 
me feet. Go on, gee up, ballot dogs, go on, look out. Go on now, keep going. Hey, go on, wait a minute, horse. Wait a minute, horse, don't go so quick. Something going wrong here. Hey, turn round, we're going wrong road. Go on, keep going. Comedy wasn't always, was it, a part of your act? No, it just somebody wrote the comedy song. I do get, Craig, when I'm making, when I was in sketches, we used to do funny sketches. I'd play the servant girl and I'd, I'd go up the wall and it was crazy and very tired and say I was drunk, but it was just mm. because I was just very, very tired. And when I get tired, I come out with silly things. And I suppose that's how a lot of that kind of thing happened. But of a straightforward approach. I try to please and I try to do what I think the people would like. When did you really realize that people would also like the moving kind of song, the emotional song, as well as the well, comic Well, always, always, mm. really, because I had the voice for it to sell those kind of songs, and that was the easiest part of my work. The comedy songs were the, were the more difficult, really, to, to make all of them sort of, but you sing them. I love to sing about somebody else in a comedy song. I, never, I don't very much like singing about myself. Shop. All right, <clears throat> There's a shop called the Co-op in the high street. By gum, it's a great idea. For out of what you spend, you get a dividend three times every year. When Ma gets two shillings for her share, she shouts, feeling like a millionaire. Stop and shop at the Co-op, the Co-op shop. What the shop is the co-op, the co-op shop. You can buy from a chop to a prop or a mop or a bottle of ginger pop at the co-op shop. As the pop shop is next to the co-op shop. When you've done your popping in the pop shop, you hop out of the pop shop and pop into the co-op shop. A proper shop, the shop, it is the co-op shop. <laughs> they have tripe nice and ripe at the co-op shop. Pink pills, powder puffs, pork pies. <laughs> Paraffin and jam, carbolic soap and ham, clothes, bags and glass eyes and pig's heads all grinning in a row will you join in this chorus sweet and low sweet and low sweet and low wind over the words hey, it's all right i heard him play it wrong tune it's all right <laughs> sleep, Lord. it's all right he can stop another fortnight <laughs> With you. You're singing the wrong song, my dear lady. Who's singing it wrong song? Hey, you're singing Sweet and Low. This is the co-op shop. I'm not singing Sweet and Low. I'm singing the co-op shop. Don't act, Dad. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it sounds like Sweet and Low to me. I'm sure it's Sweet and I, Low. I, I think you must be going potty, really. I was singing the co-op shop. I mean, I, here, Leslie, come here, Leslie. Come here, Leslie, Paul. <laughs> what was I singing, the co-op shop or Sweet and Low? I was swing, singing Sweet and Low. I Certainly was singing Sweet and Low? Yeah. I'll smack your face. More than you <laughs> Sweet and low. Both of you. You both still sing a sweet and low. Well, I'm terribly sorry. It's two to one. So <laughs> if I was singing sweet and low, I apologize. It must be my classical brain running away with me. Stop and shop at the corner. The co-op shop. <laughs> what a shop is the co-op or the co-op shop. You can buy from a chop to a prop for a mop or a bottle of ginger pop at the co-op. He never a put a
Did you ever think of developing your voice even further into an opera singer? Because I remember reading somewhere that the great Tetrazzini once asked you to why sing an aria oh, from yes. La Traviata, and why didn't you become an opera late. singer? It was too late. And uh, I'm glad I didn't now, because I think was, I've given many more people enjoyment than probably a, an opera singer, and I had more fun myself doing it. Did you ever have singing lessons of any kind? No. None at all? No. <laughs> I just pray to the Lord before I go on every night and just hope for the best and make a little noise. <laughs> all right, we'll go on. Come on. <laughs> what of all your songs is the greatest song? The song that perhaps has done most for you or, or means... Or that, I like, that I like to listen to myself. Well, well, of your own songs? I, of my songs' recordings, I, 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 now, I don't sort of listen to Sally and I don't listen to the Aspidestra. But I listen to things like uh, Angels Guard Thee and some of those good classic songs I have sung, you know, semi-classic, that I'm rather surprised when I hear them now. And I think, well, it was a voice. It was something that was a bit out of this world, but I didn't realize I had it. I didn't realize then. I realize now. Up in the garret away from the din Someone is playing an old violin Tenderly, pleadingly, so the notes fall Just for the love of the music that's all Out of the year Rapture and agony Laughter and tears Tenderly, pleadingly Playing an old fire I'm going to say very little indeed about an artist whose voice symbolizes everything that is best and most loved in that great national possession of ours. I welcome, on your behalf and with all my heart, the greatest lady of the variety stage. I need only say two words more. Our Gracie.
I have to be up to date, so I'm right and right up to date. I'm going to sing the Mockingbird Hill. When the sun in the morning peeps over the hill and kisses the roses on my window sill, then my heart fills with sadness when I hear the trill of the birds in the trees of the Mockingbird Hill. Shalala, twiddly dee dee, it gives me a thrill to wake up in the morning to the mockingbird's trill. Shalala, twiddly dee dee, there's peace and goodwill. You're welcome as the flowers on Mockingbird Hill. Got a three-cornered plow and an acre to till, and a mule that I bought for a ten-dollar bill. There's a tumble-down shack and an old rusty mill, but it's my home sweet home up on Mockingbird Hill. Shalala, twiddly dee dee, it gives me a thrill to wake up in the morning to the Mockingbird's trill. Shalala, twiddly dee dee, there's peace and goodwill. You're welcome as the flowers on Mockingbird Hill. It's late in the evening, I climb up the hill and survey all my kingdom when everything's still. Only me and the sky and an old whippoorwill singing songs in the twilight on Mockingbird Hill. Called it the betrayal and the acting was divine. It's the best film that they've had for years down at the Hippodrome and it's a good job I took my handkerchief with me when I left home. Oh, it was a lovely picture and I did enjoy it so. Oh, I never cried so much in all my life. When the villain seized the maiden, everybody shouted, oh, oh, I never cried so much in all my life. He told her that he'd wed her, then enticed her on his yacht. Then he got her tied up in a proper sailor's knot. Then he kissed her twice, the dirty dog, upon her beauty spot. Oh, I never cried so much in all my life. It takes a lot to make me cry, but oh dear, when I start and think of what that girl went through, I'm like a water cat. I see her eyes, I hear her voice at night when I'm in bed. And here's a scene I'll never, never get out of my head. As she faced the blinding snowstorm and came trudging through the town. Oh, oh, I never cried so much in all my life. Oh, and when I saw her carrying her baby upside down. Oh, I never cried so much in all my life. She lingered near the rose and crown. The wind was howling wild. When up the village street there came the father of her child. So she tapped him for a tanner for a pint of old and mild. Oh, I never cried so much in all my life. <laughs> well, now, I'm going to have the great pleasure of singing a little song from Kiss Me, Kate.
hurt me, deceive me, desert me. I'm yours till I die. So in the love, so in the love, so in the love with you, my love, am I in love? the notion that he'd make it strong and tall. So he's crossed it with an acorn from an oak tree and he's planted it against the garden wall. It shot up like a rocket till it's nearly reached the sky. It's the biggest aspidester in the world. We couldn't see the top of it, it got so blooming high. It's the biggest aspidester in the world. When father's had a snoot full at his pub, the bunch of grapes, he doesn't go all fighting mad and getting into scrapes. You'll find him in his bare skin playing Tarzan of the Apes, up the biggest aspidester in the world. The pussycats and their sweethearts love to spend their evenings out, up the biggest aspidester in the world. They all begin meowing when the buds begin to sprout from the biggest aspidester in the world the dogs all come around for miles a lovely sight to see they sniff around for hours and hours and wag their tails with glee so i've had to put a notice up to say it's not a tree it's the biggest aspidestra in the Biggest aspidestrious of all, I say, I've got a bump on my lip, which you've got a short lip, a bit of cold, see, when they say biggest aspidestra, I busted again. Well, here we go now with a very new song called At the End of the Day. At the end of the day, just kneel. a prayer for the end of the day. So when the new day begins to break, just lift up your eyes, let your heart awake, be ready to meet what the day may send, and be ready to greet every What a power you have 
found So do what you can For the others around Carry them high When they seem to be One of Grace's favorite broadcasts. 
So we've included the whole of her contribution, which brought to an end that wonderful festival of variety in 1951. By then, her husband, Monty Banks, had died, and Gracie was trying to forget her loss by taking on more and more work. She also found solace in her home on the beautiful island of Capri. Why did you choose the Isle of Capri? Well, I think it's because I like being quiet. I couldn't live in London or any big city. I can't live in New York. I want to come here. Mm. I want to get to London mm. immediately, but after been a couple of nights, I said, let's get out. Let's go somewhere small, you know, get quiet in the country. You live there, of course, now with your third husband. Monty Banks died in, in 1950, after yeah. what I'm sure yes. was a very happy marriage. Yes, it was, very. Uh, you then married Boris Salperovici. In 1952. This is the longest marriage because it, actually I've been married twice before. You could say I haven't been with either husband much at all because I was working. I was in one country or they were in another. And, and, and in England it, with Archie Pitt, it was, I was around the provinces, he was in London. But with Boris, since we've been married, we've been together the whole time, touch wood, and I hope that will stay until the end of our days. Are you a religious woman? Very, very deeply religious myself. Is this a family background? Was your, was your family religious? Yes, but I think I've taken it more on feeling deeper than the rest of them do. So when you are singing the Lord's Prayer or the Ave Maria... I it, feel the words I'm singing. I don't just sing them, I feel the words. I feel every word I'm singing in most songs, but more of those, that kind of song. Do you ever regret that, that your success has taken you away from Rochdale, from England? No. No, I don't regret it. It hasn't taken me away from, from England, really, because I, I feel that this is my home, is England. Do you miss it? Do you miss the, the, the touring, the theatre? No, I don't want to tour again. I hate getting in trains and packing a bag. Do you miss not appearing every night in the Oh, audience? no, not at all, no. No, no. No, I don't miss it at all. You seem to be so terribly contented with life. Yes, I am, too, George. <laughs> quite contented. I got everything to be contented for. As I said, the bills are paid, and I got a wonderful husband, and uh, I'm very happy and contented. But do you think that the day may come when we shall see Gracie Fields saying and singing on the stage that now is the hour to say goodbye? I don't know. <laughs> I can't tell you, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, I haven't accepted anything, as I told you, because I don't feel sure enough that I'm going to give the right bang, slap, bang up performance, you know? Is it also perhaps a little that you don't want to say goodbye to it all? No, I don't like to say goodbye. I, don't, I, don't, I hate to say goodbye. All of my songs are, oh, you got to smile when you say goodbye. Now is the hour and wish me luck when you say, wave me goodbye. I'm always doing goodbye things. I don't like saying goodbye. I would say, say au revoir, but not goodbye. Uh, let's leave it that way, eh? And God bless you, Gracie. Wheresoever in his great universe thou art. Not often enough We reflect upon the good things And our thoughts center round All those people we love And I think about those people Who mean so much to me And for so many years have made me so very happy and I count the times I have forgotten to say thank you and just how much I love you and just how much I love you.
That recording was made when Gracie was 80 at the opening of the Rochdale Theatre named after her. Within a year, she was dead in September 1979. Tomorrow, she would have been 85 years old. That uh, program about Gracie Fields was introduced by Stanley Holloway. News in Brief is next. ABC Radio 1 and 3, Eastern Summertime, 9 o'clock.